Part two of chapter eight of book one of the wealth of nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part two of chapter eight of book one of the wages of labor. The real recompense of labor, the real quantity of the necessaries and conveniencies of life which it can procure to the laborer, has, during the course of the present century, increased, perhaps, in a still greater proportion than its money price. Not only grain has become somewhat cheaper, but many other things, from which the industrious poor derive an agreeable and wholesome variety of food, have become a great deal cheaper. Potatoes, for example, do not at present, through the greater part of the kingdom, cost half the price which they used to do thirty or forty years ago. The same thing may be said of turnips, carrots, cabbages, things which were formerly never raised but by the spade, but which are now commonly raised by the plough. All sort of garden stuff, too, has become cheaper. The greater part of the apples, and even of the onions consumed in Great Britain, were, in the last century, imported from Flanders. The great improvements in the coarser manufactories of both linen and woolen cloth furnish the laborers with cheaper and better clothing, and those in the manufactories of the coarser materials with cheaper and better instruments of trade, as well as with many agreeable and convenient pieces of household furniture. Soap, salt, candles, leather, and fermented liquors have, indeed, become a good deal dear, chiefly from the taxes which have been laid upon them. The quantity of these, however, which the laboring poor are under any necessity of consuming, is so very small that the increase in their price does not compensate the diminution in that of so many other things. The common complaint, that luxury extends itself even to the lowest ranks of the people, and that the laboring poor will not now be contented with the same food, clothing, and lodging which satisfied them in former times, may convince us that it is not the money price of labor only, but its real recompense, which has augmented. Is this improvement in the circumstances of the lower ranks of the people to be regarded as an advantage, or as an inconveniency to the society? The answer seems at first abundantly plain. Servants, laborers, and workmen of different kinds make up the far greater part of every great political society. But what improves the circumstances of the greater part can never be regarded as any inconveniency to the whole. No society can surely be flourishing and happy of which the far greater part of the members are poor and miserable. It is but equity besides that they who feed, clothe, and lodge the whole body of the people should have such a share of the produce of their own labor as to be themselves tolerably well fed, clothed, and lodged. Poverty, though it no doubt discourages, does not always prevent marriage. It seems even to be favorable to generation. A half-starved highland woman frequently bears more than twenty children, while a pampered fine lady is often incapable of bearing any, and is generally exhausted by two or three. Barrenness, so frequent among women of fashion, is very rare among those of inferior station. Luxury, in the fair sex, while it inflames, perhaps the passion for enjoyment, seems also to weaken, and frequently to destroy altogether, the powers of generation. But poverty, though it does not prevent the generation, is extremely unfavorable to the rearing of children. The tender plant is produced, but in so cold a soil and so severe a climate soon withers and dies. It is not uncommon, I have been frequently told, in the highlands of Scotland, for a mother who has borne twenty children not to have two alive. Several officers of great experience have assured me that, so far from recruiting their regiment, they have never been able to supply it with drums and fifes from all the soldiers' children that were born in it. A greater number of fine children, however, is seldom seen anywhere than about a barrack of soldiers. Very few of them, it seems, arrive at the age of thirteen or fourteen. In some places, one half the children die before they are four years of age, in many places before they are seven, and in almost all places before they are nine or ten. This great mortality, however, will everywhere be found chiefly among the children of the common people, who cannot afford to tend them with the same care as those of better station. Though their marriages are generally more fruitful than those of people of fashion, a smaller proportion of their children arrive at maturity. In founding hospitals, and among the children brought up by parish charities, the mortality is still greater than among those of the common people. Every species of animals naturally multiplies in proportion to the means of their subsistence, and no species can ever multiply beyond it. But in civilized society it is only among the inferior ranks of people that the scantiness of subsistence can set limits to the further multiplication of the human species, and it can do so in no other way than by destroying a great part of the children which their fruitful marriages produce. 
the liberal reward of labor by enabling them to provide better for their children and consequently to bring up a greater number naturally tends to widen and extend those limits it deserves to be remarked too that it necessarily does this as nearly as possible in the proportion which the demand for labor requires if this demand is continually increasing the reward of labor must necessarily encourage in such a manner the marriage and multiplication of labors as may enable them to supply that continually increasing demand by a continually increasing population if the reward should at any time be less than what was requisite for this purpose the deficiency of hands would soon raise it and if it should at any time be more their excessive multiplication would soon lower it to this necessary rate the market would be so much understocked with labor in the one case and so much overstocked in the other as would soon force back its price to that proper rate which the circumstances of the society required it is in this manner that the demand for men like that for any other commodity necessarily regulates the production of men quickens it when it goes on too slowly and stops it when it advances too fast it is this demand which regulates and determines the state of propagation in all the different countries of the world in north america in europe and in china which renders it rapidly progressive in the first slow and gradual in the second and altogether stationary in the last the wear and tear of a slave it has been said is at the expense of his master but that of a free servant is at his own expense the wear and tear of the latter however is in reality as much at the expense of his master as that of the former the wages paid to journeymen and servants of every kind must be such as may enable them one with another to continue the race of journeymen and servants according as the increase diminishing or stationary demand of the society may happen to require but though the wear and tear of a free servant be equally at the expense of his master it generally costs him much less than that of a slave the fund destined for replacing or repairing if i may say so the wear and tear of the slave is commonly managed by a negligent master or careless overseer that destined for performing the same office with regard to the free man is managed by the free man himself the disorders which generally prevail in the economy of the rich naturally introduce themselves into the management of the former the strict frugality and parsimonious attention of the poor as naturally establish themselves in that of the latter under such different management the same purpose must require very different degrees of expense to execute it it appears accordingly from the experience of all ages and nations i believe that the work done by freemen comes cheaper in the end than that performed by slaves it is found to do so even at boston new york and philadelphia where the wages of common labor are so very high the liberal reward of labor therefore as it is the effect of increasing wealth so it is the cause of increasing population to complain of it is to lament over the necessary cause and effect of the greatest public prosperity it deserves to be remarked perhaps that it is in the progressive state while the society is advancing to the further acquisition rather than when it has acquired its full complement of riches that the condition of the laboring poor of the great body of the people seems to be the happiest and the most comfortable it is hard in the stationary and miserable in the declining state the progressive state is in reality the cheerful and the hearty state to all the different orders of the society the stationary is dull the declining melancholy the liberal reward of labor as it encourages the propagation so it increases the industry of the common people the wages of labor are the encouragement of industry which like every other human quality improves in proportion to the encouragement it receives a plentiful subsistence increases the bodily strength of the laborer and the comfortable hope of bettering his condition and of ending his days perhaps in ease and plenty animates him to exert that strength to the utmost where wages are high accordingly we shall always find the workmen more active diligent and expeditious than where they are low in england for example than in scotland in the neighbourhood of great towns than in remote country places some workmen indeed when they can earn in four days what will maintain them through the week will be idle the other three this however is by no means the case with the greater part workmen on the contrary when they are liberally paid by the peace are very apt to overwork themselves and to ruin their health and constitution in a few years a carpenter in london and in some other places is not supposed to last in his utmost vigour above eight years something of the same kind happens in many other trades in which the workmen are paid by the piece as they generally are in manufactures and even in country labour wherever wages are higher than ordinary almost every class of artificers is subject to some peculiar infirmity occasioned by excessive application to their peculiar species of work Ramazzini, an eminent Italian physician, has written a particular book concerning such diseases. We do not reckon our soldiers the most industrious set of people among us. 
yet when soldiers have been employed in some particular sorts of work and liberally paid by the peace their officers have frequently been obliged to stipulate with the undertaker that they should not be allowed to earn above a certain sum every day according to the rate at which they were paid till this stipulation was made mutual emulation and the desire of greater gain frequently prompted them to overwork themselves and to hurt their health by excessive labour excessive application during four days of the week is frequently the real cause of the idleness of the other three so much and so loudly complained of great labour either of mind or body continued for several days together is in most men naturally followed by a great desire of relaxation which if not restrained by force or by some strong necessity is almost irresistible it is the call of nature which requires to be relieved by some indulgence sometimes of ease only but sometimes too of dissipation and diversion if it is not complied with the consequences are often dangerous and sometimes fatal and such as almost always sooner or later bring on the peculiar infirmity of the trade if masters would always listen to the dictates of reason and humanity they have frequently occasion rather to moderate than to animate the application of many of their workmen it will be found i believe in every sort of trade that the man who works so moderately as to be able to work constantly not only preserves his health the longest but in the course of the year executes the greatest quantity of work in cheap years it is pretended workmen are generally more idle and in dear times more industrious than ordinary a plentiful subsistence therefore it has been concluded relaxes and a scanty one quickens their industry that a little more plenty than ordinary may render some workmen idle cannot be well doubted but that it should have this effect upon the greater part or that men in general should work better when they are ill-fed than when they are well fed when they are disheartened than when they are in good spirits when they are frequently sick than when they are generally in good health seems not very probable years of dearth it is to be observed are generally among the common people years of sickness and mortality which cannot fail to diminish the produce of their industry in years of plenty servants frequently leave their masters and trust their subsistence to what they can make by their own industry but the same cheapness of provisions by increasing the fund which is destined for the maintenance of servants encourages masters farmers especially to employ a greater number farmers upon such occasions expect more profit from their corn by maintaining a few more labouring servants than by selling it at a low price in the market the demand for servants increases while the number of those who offer to supply that demand diminishes the price of labour therefore frequently rises in cheap years in years of scarcity the difficulty and uncertainty of subsistence make all such people eager to return to service but the high price of provisions by diminishing the funds destined for the maintenance of servants disposes masters rather to diminish than to increase the number of those they have in dear years too poor independent workmen frequently consume the little stock with which they had used to supply themselves with the materials of their work and are obliged to become journeymen for subsistence more people want employment than easily get it many are willing to take it upon lower terms than ordinary and the wages of both servants and journeymen frequently sink in dear years masters of all sorts therefore frequently make better bargains with their servants in dear than in cheap years and find them more humble and dependent in the former than in the latter they naturally therefore commend the former as more favourable to industry landlords and farmers besides two of the largest classes of masters have another reason for being pleased with dear years the rents of the one and the profits of the other depend very much upon the price of provisions nothing can be more absurd however than to imagine that men in general should work less when they work for themselves than when they work for other people a poor independent workman will generally be more industrious than even a journeyman who works by the piece the one enjoys the whole produce of his own industry the other shares it with his master the one in his separate independent state is less liable to the temptations of bad company which in large manufactories so frequently ruin the morals of the other the superiority of the independent workmen over those servants who are hired by the month or by the year and whose wages and maintenance are the same whether they do much or do little is likely to be still greater cheap years tend to increase the proportion of independent workmen to journeymen and servants of all kinds and dear years to diminish it a french author of great knowledge and ingenuity mr Massance, receiver of the tallies in the election of st etienne endeavours to show that the poor do more work in cheap than in dear years by comparing the quantity and value of the goods made upon those different occasions in three different manufactures one of coarse woollens carried on in elbeuf one of linen and another of silk both which extend through the whole generality of rouen it appears from his account which is copied from the registers of the public offices that the quantity and value of the goods made in all those three manufactories has generally been greater in cheap than in dear years and that it has always been 
greatest in the cheapest, and least in the dearest years. All the three seem to be stationary manufactures, or which, though their produce may vary somewhat from year to year, are, upon the whole, neither going backwards nor forwards. The manufacture of linen in Scotland, and that of coarse woollens in the West Riding of Yorkshire, are growing manufactures, of which the produce is generally, though with some variations, increasing both in quantity and value. Upon examining, however, the accounts which have been published of their annual produce, I have not been able to observe that its variations have had any sensible connection with the dearness or cheapness of the seasons. In 1740, a year of great scarcity, both manufactures, indeed, appear to have declined very considerably. But in 1756, another year of great scarcity, the Scotch manufacturers made more than ordinary advances. The Yorkshire manufacture, indeed, declined, and its produce did not rise to what it had been in 1755 till 1766, after the repeal of the American Stamp Act. In that and the following year, it greatly exceeded what it had ever been before, and it has continued to advance ever since. The produce of all great manufacturers for distant sale must necessarily depend not so much upon the dearness or cheapness of the seasons in the countries where they are carried on, as upon the circumstances which affect the demand in the countries where they are consumed, upon peace or war, upon the prosperity or declension of other rival manufacturers, and upon the good or bad humor of their principal customers. A great part of the extraordinary work besides which is probably done in cheap years never enters the public registers of manufacturers. The men-servants, who leave their masters, become independent laborers. The women return to their parents, and commonly spin in order to make clothes for themselves and their families. Even the independent workmen do not always work for public sale, but are employed by some of their neighbors and manufacturers for family use. The produce of their labor, therefore, frequently makes no figure in those public registers, of which the records are sometimes published with so much parade, and from which our merchants and manufacturers would often vainly pretend to announce the prosperity or declension of the greatest empires. Though the variations in the price of labor not only do not always correspond with those in the price of provisions, but are frequently quite opposite, we must not, upon this account, imagine that the price of provisions has no influence upon that of labor. The money price of labor is necessarily regulated by two circumstances, the demand for labor and the price of the necessaries and conveniencies of life. The demand for labor, according as it happens to be increasing, stationary or declining, or to require an increasing, stationary or declining population, determines the quantities of the necessaries and conveniencies of life which must be given to the laborer, and the money price of labor is determined by what is requisite for purchasing this quantity. Though the money price of labor, therefore, is sometimes high where the price of provisions is low, it would be still higher, the demand continuing the same, if the price of provisions was high. It is because the demand for labor increases in years of sudden and extraordinary plenty, and diminishes in those of sudden and extraordinary scarcity, that the money price of labor sometimes rises in the one and sinks in the other. In a year of sudden and extraordinary plenty, there are funds in the hands of many of the employers of industry, sufficient to maintain and employ a greater number of industrious people than had been employed the year before. And this extraordinary number cannot always be bad. Those masters, therefore, who want more workmen, bid against one another in order to get them, which sometimes raises both the real and the money price of their labor. The contrary of this happens in a year of sudden and extraordinary scarcity. The funds destined for employing industry are less than they had been the year before. A considerable number of people are thrown out of employment, who bid one against another in order to get it, which sometimes lowers both the real and the money price of labor. In 1740, a year of extraordinary scarcity, many people were willing to work for bare subsistence. In the succeeding years of plenty, it was more difficult to get laborers and servants. The scarcity of a dear year, by diminishing the demand for labor, tends to lower its price, as the high price of provisions tends to raise it. The plenty of a cheap year, on the contrary, by increasing the demand, tends to raise the price of labor, as the cheapness of provisions tends to lower it. In the ordinary variations of the prices of provisions, those two opposite causes seem to counterbalance one another, which is probably, in part, the reason why the wages of labor are everywhere so much more steady and permanent than the price of provisions. The increase in the wages of labor necessarily increases the price of many commodities, by increasing that part of it which resolves itself into wages, and so far tends to diminish their consumption, both at home and abroad. The same cause, however, which raises the wages of labor, the increase of stock, tends to increase its productive powers and to make a smaller quantity of labor produce a greater quantity of work. The owner of the stock which employs a great number of laborers necessarily endeavors, for his own advantage, to make such a proper division and distribution of employment, that they may be enabled to produce the greatest quantity of work possible. 
For the same reason he endeavours to supply them with the best machinery which either he or they can think of. What takes place among the labourers in a particular workhouse takes place for the same reason among those of a great society. The greater their number, the more they naturally divide themselves into different classes and subdivisions of employment. More heads are occupied in inventing the most proper machinery for executing the work of each, and it is, therefore, more likely to be invented. There are many commodities, therefore, which, in consequence of these improvements, come to be produced by so much less labour than before, that the increase of its price is more than compensated by the diminution of its quantity. End of Book 1, Chapter 8, Part 2